Hi everyone, thanks for attending this talk. Um, we're going to talk a bit today about how to, well, the work we did on, on the chip to support the camera interface it has, um, and more generally how do V4L works for camera interfaces in general, not like applied, applied to the chip. Um, so I'm Maxim, um, I'm an embedded Linux engineer for, I've been in for five years now, a bit more than five years, at Free Electrons. Um, and part of my work involves uh, working on various embedded components, so Linux, obviously, but also build root, U-boot, Bearbox, um, and so on. And so I'm also the co-maintainer of the old winner resources. Um, so the chip using one of the old winner resources, I'm, I've been working on it. Um, yeah, and I live in France. So um, maybe you've not heard about the chip, which is, it's basically an SBC, a single board computer, um, that is sold for $9. It has been introduced last year through a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and it's based on an old winner SOC, which is um, equivalent to the old winner SOC, which is called the A13, which was out like four years ago or something like that. Um, if in terms of horsepower, it's roughly equivalent to a big old bone black, um, roughly. Um, pretty much the same generation of CPU, GPU, and, and so on. Um, so it has a one gigahertz Cortex A8 CPU, a Mali GPU, and a lot of GPIOs to do whatever you want with it. Um, Wi-Fi as well. Um, and it's running some kind of a mainline kernel. Uh, so, so far we have a branch that is based on 4.4. We plan on doing a 4.9 branch very soon because we basically upstream most of it. So it's going to be quite easy anyway. Um, and so as part of supporting the chip, uh, so it started a year ago when we started working on the mainline support for the winner resources, um, like four years ago. It was in yeah, ELC Barcelona, actually. So yeah, 2012. Um, so there was already a significant part of the work that was done um, and found in the mainline kernel. But since we were all OBS at the time, um, basically everything that was quite hard to do was left out. Um, so the NAND support in particular, um, the display GPU support was like non-existent. Um, and we had all the other nice things to have when you want to have some generic purpose SBC like audio, camera, VPU support that were also completely, completely left out because, well, it was a significant effort and no one really wants to tackle that on their weekend and like evenings. Um, and so obviously we had also to tackle board specific developments. So for example, we have a very unusual setup when it comes to regulators um, for the Wi-Fi chip. Um, and we also have some kind of additions that you can plug onto the chip um, that uses some kind of a noto discovery mechanism that is called, well, the boards themselves are called DIP, but yeah, in general, the DIP support. So we had to like, use that in the kernel as well. But yeah, and so part of that work was actually to support the camera. Um, there's another talk from my colleague Boris this afternoon about the NAND support, if you're interested. It's actually very interesting. Um, so yeah, so part of the work was to work on the camera. And well, camera support in Linux has to go through the V4L framework, and that's what we are going to talk about today. Um, so uh, this video capture in Linux is handled by a framework that is called Video for Linux 2, um, most of the time just referred to as V4L2, which is quite old, or at least it existed for a very long time. Um, so it was first introduced in 2002, and it supports a wide range of devices from video capture, like camera that we're going to see, to like hardware decoders and encoders, um, software-defined radio as well, uh, radio receivers, and, and so on. So it's actually very ubiquitous. Um, it can support scalers as well. Well, basically everything that 
supposed to work on video in Linux is, is with v V4L. Um, and so in the cases of cameras, a very simple setup, and it's kind of the one that we actually have on, on the chip, um, on the SOC that is used on the chip at least, um, is that basically you have two components, um, one being the camera sensor itself, so the actual component that captures frames and send them to some kind of bus. Um, and then on the other side, on the SOC side, you actually have a controller that well, basically reads that bus and transfers the data to a, a memory buffer, and that's it. Um, so obviously, there's a bit more to it. Um, so for example, you will need to uh, tune some camera parameters most of the time to be able to, I don't know, change contrast, brightness, um, that kind of stuff. Um, focus, maybe, as well. Um, and so you have, um, usually, um, in addition to that bus, an I2C bus to be able to control whatever the camera is sending on, on that bus, basically. Um, yeah. And so when it comes to, form, um, to cameras, the very first thing is that you have to like negotiate some kind of format. So are you going to use a plain RGB format or some YUV variant or something like that? And obviously, both sides have to agree, both the controller and the camera. Um, if there's a mismatch, base case scenario, the image will look a bit weird. Worst case scenario, you will not see anything, um, and so your sensor doesn't work at all. Um, and so there's a very wide range of video formats, um, and you even have some weird variations of them um, from someone that basically never did video before actually starting this project. This looks like a giant mess. Um, so you have different, for example, just speaking of YUV, YUV can have like the so you basically have three fields, but the, the order in, so these three fields will have different bit width, basically, which we, you can expect, but the order of the fields can actually change as well. Um, I'll be put in different buffers, I'll be put in the same buffers, but at a different offset, and so it's like completely weird. It was completely weird to me at first, and I'm still confused about that. Um, and so, obviously, most of the time, um, the set of formats that the controller and the sensor support are not exactly matching. So you have to negotiate um, at some point which format you can basically do on your um, sensor and controller pipeline. Um, and so it's usually done in the drivers, um, at least for these particular setups. Um, and so the first thing you will need is actually to negotiate and try to see what format the sensor support, what format you, you support, and basically give the list to the user space and let the user space decide what it wants to use. Um, after, the, uh, after the format's negoci negotiation, and well, obviously at some point the user space will also have to set the formats and will you will actually use it in your capture stream. You also have to implement some streaming hooks, which are basically just starting, stopping the capture, um, but also deals with memory allocation, so allocating the buffers, queuing them, dequeuing them once the capture has been occurring, and, and so on. Um, and so together with the format, it's basically the only really needed operations to like, get started. Um, because then you can actually set format and then um, queue buffer into your controller that will then fill it with an image coming from the camera and like dequeuing it um, once the capture has been occurring. Um, the nice thing about streaming modes is that you actually have different um, backend, if you want, uh, for that streaming mode. Um, so you can have different source of buffers um, that are going to be used differently. So and it's completely like transparent to your to your driver, basically. Um, so you basically have three sources. The first one is um, the user that 
provided a buffer. So the buffer has been allocated in user space, and the buffer gives it to your driver for you to fill it. Um, that's not very widely used, to be honest, because that means that your controller is able to do DMA scatter gather to be able to deal with non physically contiguous buffers, um, which are usually allocated in user space. Um, it might come from another device in the system, and it's shared um, with the sensor, with the controller, sorry, with a mechanism called DMA buff, which is basically a mechanism to share buffers across different devices. So the allocation will not actually occur in your, neither in your controller driver or your, or even v at all. It's just coming from an external source. Maybe for, for example, DRM, if you just want to like display um, the captured image directly, um, directly and put it directly in your display pipeline uh, without any copy or something like that. Um, or it can be allocated by the driver itself um, directly, um, which is probably the most, um, <laughs> at least, uh, intuitive um, way of operating, at least in it basically just works like any other drivers usually found in Linux. Um, yeah. And so you basically, for all of these streaming operations, because it's actually quite hard to do right, um, you have a generic implementation that is called Video Buff 2, um, which is actually very nice. Um, and it will do most of the work and still rely on very few and simple callbacks to implement in your driver. Um, and so you have the ability in your driver to choose different um, allocation methods depending on your, on, your, uh, on your actual hardware and what can, it can do. So you can choose between uh, backed by the virtual memory allocator. Um, I'm not sure it's very useful for devices that do DMA, unless they can do scatter gather scatter gather as well. Um, but then you have scatter gather DMA. Um, or you can actually ask for contiguous, physically contiguous DMA buffers if your device is not able to do any kind of scatter gather, but just fill uh, contiguous array memory. Um, and you have the streaming modes notions as well. Um, yeah, so it's actually very fix flexible. And the only thing you need is um, in the callbacks, to basically tell it um, <coughs> what size and the number of buffers you need to allocate um, for each frame, for example. Um, so for example, for a given format at a given resolution, what is the size of my buffer? Do I have some extra padding? Do I have some to be able to control it? Um, and how then to insert new buffers into your queue um, and basically just start and stop the capture. Um, so it's very convenient. Um, yeah. uh, for the actual um, devices, you, you actually might need more than just being able to tell uh, which format you want to use and let it capture some videos. Um, most of the time, you will have some extra controls in, in either your driver or the sensor itself um, that you will need to at least expose to user space um, for things like brightness, white balance, saturation, um, things like that. Uh, and by default, there's basically no controls implemented. Um, so the driver needs to declare them during probe. So there's a lot of them that are standards, but you still need to declare that you actually support those standard controls. Um, and then you have a dedicated callback that you will basically will be called when someone will set that control to a new, new value. Um, so um, it's actually very, in, in that particular setup, it's kind of, it was kind of confusing to me at least as well, because you also, you will also expose um, the controls from the camera um, sometimes uh, to be 
because there's basically just a single video node, uh, a single video device in your in slash dev. Um, so you will still need to be able to tune this. And so you basically have to forward um, the controls. Um, yeah. And so if you look at it from, um, if you look at the same pipeline that we were seeing, you will basically have from a driver point of view, you will have different driver for the controller and the camera um, that are probed at different time and are exposed by the users to the user space through a single device, which is dev video and then a number. Um, and so since the two drivers are completely independent of each other, they are not linked in any way but through the V4L framework, um, you will actually have need to have some kind of synchronization point where you know that you have your controller driver and your camera drivers that have been loaded that are ready to operate and are ready to like link the two together. And it's done through a framework which is called V4L2 Async, which is um, very similar to other similar well to other uh, um, uh, frameworks in, in, in Linux, like you have the one in ASOC that does pretty much the same thing, that allows you to tie um, what they call in ASOC a DAI, so basically the thing that will stream music to an external codec, um, and the codec which is also controlled through so S2C, so they have, basically have the same, um, the same needs, and DRM has some kind of a generic implementation that is used only by DRM, I think, um, which is called the component framework, um, which is kind of um, kind of um, doing the same thing. And it's so basically, it's a two-stage probe. And in the actual driver probe that you usually have, you will basically just re register in V4L2 async and wait for some for your camera or controller driver to show up, and then do the actual setup of your hardware and so on in that second stage probe that is called only when the two are linked together. It's also where you will do the format enumerations um, and, and so on. Um, yeah. And so if you, if you really look at it from um, what is actually happening in the system when you capture something, um, you will, it will basically come in a few steps. The first one is you will basically set the formats and the, and the controls um, to be able to like prepare your, your capture and set it up in exactly how you want it to be. Um, then the video buff um, um, framework or generic implementation will actually allocate the buffers give them back to the user space, and then the user space will start queuing buffer um, so that your capture can actually start. Um, you will so start the capture with already a bunch of buffers that are queued so that you can, you will not have any gaps or underruns or anything. And then you will, maybe not on all hardware, but on most, I think, um, each time a new frame will, be, will, have be, will have been captured, you basically have an interrupt. So you will just have to handle in the interrupt the buffer flip so you will take a new buffer from your queue, place it um, as an actual buffer to be used for the next frame, and the queue the one that was done before and give it back to the user space. Uh, so the whole dequeuing thing is um, once again something that has been implemented um, in a generic way because it's actually difficult to do, right? Um, um, yeah. And so if at some point you want to stop streaming, you can, uh, but otherwise your capture will just go on um, and loop between the interrupts, buffer flipping, and, and so on. Um, yeah. So that was for the very simple um, drivers, but you also might um, have some more, for example, complicated formats um, like YUV for example, might have, might store the three Y, U, and V components in one or two separate buffers again. So you basically have to put there like from one to three buffers depending on the actual format you want to use. 
and to queue them, dequeue them as well. Um, and so for, it's supported in V4L through a different um, capture type. So we basically say that you can do, that you have a different capability than if you just support a single, um, a single plane format. Um, the callbacks we implement in that case are different, but not so much. The um, conversion from um, um, a driver that supports only formats with a single plane to a driver that supports formats with multiple planes is very, well, almost trivial. It's not very difficult. Um, it's basically, you basically have the same arguments, but instead of taking a single structure, you will take a list of them uh, most of the time. So it's just iterating through the arguments instead of just using them. It's not much more difficult. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we should probably have started with that uh, format that actually require uh, install various um, components of your image into different buffers are called multiplane. And so you have, once again, weird variations um, for these multiplanes. For example, with YUV, you could have YUV packed into a single, single buffer or Y in a in a buffer and U and V in a second one, or Y, U and V in different buffers. So it really, like, it's really up to you and to the hardware you actually support um, to know what, what to implement. Um, and you might also have a bit more complicated setup. Um, for example, if you actually have some kind of a like controller or um, image processing engine or something like that. That is, for example, optional um, that you can um, add or not into your pipeline that will have its own set of controls. Um, and so in this case, you need to use um, another API, which is called the Media Controller API, that will basically expose all those devices, sensor included, as different um, device files in your in your in your system you will actually be able to also enumerate basically your pipeline and the um, topology of your pipeline as well through that um, through that media controller API um, and you will well, you will basically have a different tool to manipulate it as well which is called media CTL um, and it might even simplify your driver because in some cases, uh, well, for example, the format negotiation will not be done anymore because it's up to the user to actually set up on all the different nodes uh, a format that is um, actually consistent and can, can be used. But you also will gain a few things. For example, if you have the same control over different devices in your pipeline, for example, you can, in your camera and your controller, um, in the first one, uh, the one closest to the RAM, um, you will, for example, you might change the brightness on the two sides. So in this case, it's actually easier to deal with because you basically have two different entities uh, with the same set of controls and you can tune them um, and that's it. Um, yeah, um, I think. I went way too easy, too, too fast. Anyway, um, so, um, yeah. And you have a bunch of tests that are actually quite interesting. The first one is an application that is called V4L2 compliance, which is coming from basically outside of the V4L2 world is something that is awesome. Um, it's basically a tool that you run in user space and will tell you if you are actually implementing V4L2 right or not. So it will query the formats, try to do various stuff, and at the end you know if you did things right, at least from the user space point of view, um, or not. And it's like it's the best tool ever when you are actually developing a driver. Um, I wish other actual framework were having that because it's yeah, awesome. Um, you also have the other bunch of V4L2 tools. So for example, V4L info can actually give you some, uh, well, information which are, it can be used for debugging when you are actually writing your driver. 
Um, there's an application called Yafta, um, which is also very nice because it allows you to grab some frames and put them into a file instead of displaying them. So if you actually want to do some headless development just for, for example, because you have a development board sitting on your desk that is not connected to any display or anything, or if you actually want to um, inspect your frames or make sure that they are all the same, for example, using a CRC or whatever, it's actually very convenient. Um, but, and then, yeah, the final, the final um, application is basically all the V4L enabled application out there. So you have a bunch of them. Um, I use Cheese, for example, which, because I'm using Gnome and GTK and so on, but there's probably way, way many others. Um, yeah. Um, and so, um, so this is actually only part of basically grabbing a frame from a camera and putting it into memory, but it's not doing anything helpful behind that. An application using uh, V4L might be able to display it using the X server, for example, or whatever toolkit that it uses, um, but you might have something smarter to do. Um, and so it's probably what we are going to do do at some point. Um, the first one is integrate it into DRM. Um, so in our case, I don't know if it's a case for most SOCs, but I can figure, I guess. Um, basically, the camera and display engines can actually work in the same format. So you can actually allocate uh, a plane that will be directly rendered on your video output that is directly at the output format of the camera, which is actually very nice because then you can just do, basically start capturing frames um, from the camera and then putting it directly into DRM without any CPU intervention, without any copy, um, without any um, format change, without um, actually having to do any kind of composition. It's all done in the hardware and through buffer sharing. So it's actually, it would be very, very nice to support. Um, so the display engine is even able to like rescale the video or rotate it or stuff like that directly in hardware. So it's actually something that we want to support at some point. Um, and I'm not sure how it could be done in user space. Um, um, probably something like GStreamer or maybe there's some kind of um, set up file like Halza has for cards in somewhere in user space. I don't know, maybe you will tell me, I hope so. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure X is able to work with planes as well, so that might be challenging. Um, but maybe see you next year to talk about that. Um, and the next one is that we also had a different V4L uh, project going on. Um, this summer, which was to support the hardware decoder for, that is used in these SOCs. And this hardware decoder is um, actually also able to encode. Um, so it's probably going to be even longer shot um, because the whole VPU is closed entirely. There's no documentation for it. Um, so it's all based on reverse engineering. And it doesn't work for any format in encoding, I think. Um, no, at least entirely. There's some partial reverse engineering happening, but it's not complete yet. Um, but decoding definitely works for now, for some codecs and most of the image formats. Um, and it would be actually very nice to actually, to well, be able to encode the frames into, for example, H.264 directly through the VPU without doing any kind of copies as well uh, and just like giving it to, to, to the VPU directly and just grabbing the compressed, um, compressed frames. So yeah. Um, so I went way too fast. So if you have any questions, we have a lot of time. And I have microphones as well. No one? I was fast, and you don't have any questions. Wow. Um, yeah. So what is the overhead for the CPU 
for, for the whole frame grabbing and uh, buffer management. Is there any significant overhead or is it just uh, below 1% of CPU usage? For the buffer management? For, for video capturing, say, so the whole video streaming part, to take it from the hardware and put it to the user space. We actually were not that far yet. I'm still grabbing, um, <laughs> grabbing frames directly into files, so I'm not exactly sure how the display overhead would be. Um, and I've not really benchmarked it yet. Um, I'm guessing from the actual code, um, the CPU doesn't intervene much, uh, but basically handling interrupts and flipping the buffers and passing the buffers to user space, but it doesn't do any kind of um, um, format conversion, compositing, or anything like that as far as capturing is involved. It's actually when you want to display it um, that you will need to try to be smart. Uh, and so that's why we want to go through basically the display and trying to do that because then the CPU doesn't intervene as well. As well. It's basically all done in hardware. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing for the capturing part, it's not that bad. Um, you don't have a lot of interrupts because it's, well, basically just a video, so you probably will have something like dozens, a few dozens of frames per second, and that's it. So a few dozens of interrupts as well. Um, yeah. It's maybe, well, the same question I would have for the latency. So between the frame is uh, released by the sensor hardware and is available in the user space. Do we have any feeling or data for that? Um, I don't, but I don't think it would actually matter that much. <clears throat> There's no buffering taking place between the sensor and the DMA. So basically what the sensor outputs goes almost directly into the memory. So there is no latency. So you, you have to wait until the frame is complete. So that is your latency, basically. Uh, I missed the first few minutes of the presentation, so maybe yeah. I already said that. What's the approximate performance you could get out of this hardware just for streaming to memory? Can you do HD at that? Mm, not, with, not with this generation of SOC. Um, it's actually limited to, so I'm not sure which variant of VGA it is, but it's 640 by 320, I think. 480? Yeah. 480. So it's very, very low, actually. Um, the newer generations of uh, all winners so can do much more than that. Um, but yeah, this one is not very good with that regard. And, and for, for snapshots from the sensor, that you can just, for example, a five megapixel snapshot every few seconds, that should work? Yeah. Okay. It, it should, and if it doesn't, it's a bug, and you should report it to me. <laughs> okay. You mentioned in the future developments <coughs> things about scaling um, and how that could be handled by user space. And well, you had open questions there. Could you elaborate a bit more on the problems that you see? Well, I'm not exactly sure which user space component would be like making the link between the frames that are grabbed by V4L and put into a DRM plane, basically, right. with the right like scaling ratio and so on. But that's a different story. Okay, so your use case is displaying the, the video that's captured by camera directly to a DRM device? Yeah, directly to a DRM plane. Okay. Um, so in that case, well, you, you need a user space application that has, handles that. Um, there's multiple options, but you need a de dedicated application. You can't expect your display server usually to go directly to the camera device. So okay. GStreamer is definitely one option there. Okay. Uh, there could be custom applications as well. But as long as you, you share buffer with DMA buffer proper performances, um, then it's just a setup of the, the capture pipeline indeed with the, with the scaler. Okay. Um, so any camera application, 
should, if it's DMABF based, uh, work in that context. Okay, nice. So you said that the controller and the actual sensor are kind of uh, different. So you have you have really independent drivers. So that means that if you have a sensor that works on one SOC, it will work on the on another controller. So on another SOC with a different controller. Or? From a like theoretical point of view, yeah, definitely. Um, but uh, most of the time, like the actual media controller API I was mentioning uh, is not supported by all sensors, for example. So if you're, um, DT support is one of the also um, kind of not supported by every sensor driver. So it's, it, V4 allows you to do that, but the state of each individual driver might not. And so in this case, the proper fix is just fixing the sensor driver and that's it. Just a follow up to the question. Uh, I just wanted to know what uh, a use case for the media controller API. Um, a general use case. I mean, that's, uh, to understand better. There's um, a few of them. The first one is um, so it's not obvious from these slides, but um, in other like camera interfaces, so I'm guessing the map 3 one is a good example of that. Uh, you actually have not just one controller sitting aside from it, but you actually have a very complex pipeline with your video um, capturing a stream can actually take multiple passes, um, and you actually have to set it up some way. Um, and so in this case, since you basically have something like 20 or 25 components, you actually want to be able to like select the muxes um, controls for each of the components in the path. Um, and in this case, a media API is actually very, very interesting. Um, I'm guessing uh, it also it's also convenient to be able to enumerate devices as well, um, because otherwise you don't have any way to actually enumerate pipeline and so on. Um, so basically, kind of a IPU uh, processing pipeline. Um, if by IPU you mean image I, processing unit, it so might image be processing, yeah, it's yeah, it like might be somewhere in that pipeline, yeah. Okay. So the basic idea behind the media controller is to expose more of the device internals to user space. We, th we started with a video file Linux API uh, that had the model of the device that was quite simple. Um, and then over time realized that for really complex devices when you have a complex processing pipeline, it wasn't possible to just use that abstraction and in the kernel driver um, handle the, uh, drive the, the hardware in a meaningful way. So if you have multiple processing blocks that can all do the same kind of operations, uh, it's use case dependent whether you use one or the other. So we didn't want to have that kind of policy in kernel space. So that, that's, why, that's what drove the, the development of the media control API, to be able to expose the complexity to user space and let user space control the device and with a finer grain, uh, grain control. That also means that you need in user space a more complex piece of code uh, that knows more about your device to be able to use it in a meaningful way. I guess that's it. Um, thanks for attending. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be somewhere in the conference for the two next days. <laughs>